from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Investors have poured north of $30 billion in independent foundation model players, including OpenAI, Anthropic, Cohere, Mistral, and others. OpenAI itself has raised more than $20 billion. Now, to keep pace, both Meta and XAI will have to spend comparable amounts to OpenAI. Now, in our view, the stampeding herd of LLM investors is blindly focused on the false grail of so-called artificial general intelligence, or AGI. We believe the greatest value capture exists in what we're calling enterprise AGI, metaphorically represented by the proprietary data estates and managerial know-how locked inside of firms like J.P. Morgan Chase and virtually every enterprise. The tools to curate and harness that collective intelligence will allow these firms to capture the majority of value in the race for AI leadership, in our view. Hello, and welcome to this week's The Cube Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I dig deep into the economics of foundation models, and we look at an opportunity that few are contemplating, specifically what we're calling enterprise AGI and the untapped opportunities that exist within enterprises and within enterprise data. While some are talking about this, few articulate the missing pieces and gaps that we hope to describe for you. Today, George, welcome. Good to see you as always. Good to see you, Dave. Okay, let's start with the catalyst for the AI wave that we're currently riding. Here we show Sam Altman, the CEO of OpenAI. He's often associated with the drive to create AGI. Now we're using a definition of AGI where the AI can perform any economically useful function better than humans can. So we're not referring to super intelligence or Ray Kurzweil's idea that our consciousness will be stored and perpetually survivable. Rather, we're referring to and talking about doing work. Now in the middle of this graphic, we show a scene from Indiana Jones in The Last Crusade where the character drinks from a golden chalice believing it to be the Holy Grail. And in the context of AGI, the Holy Grail represents the ultimate achievement in AI, the true AGI that so many seem to be chasing. Now, the rightmost image is from the same movie, showing the man after he drinks from the wrong grail. The meme suggests that while the pursuit of AGI, the Holy Grail, is appealing, its outcomes are perhaps illusory. Now, George, in the he had a different idea. He was more humble, wasn't he? Please explain. So Indy didn't go for the chalice that he believed belonged to a king. He, as an archaeologist, looked for something much more prosaic, as he said, the cup of a carpenter. Similarly, AGI in the enterprise may really be the pursuit of something much more prosaic than this um, intergalactic AGI that... Uh, we were talking about in the last slide, it's the ability to gradually learn more and more of the white collar work processes of the firm. And instead of one all intelligent AGI, it's really a swarm of modestly intelligent agents that can collectively augment human white collar work. So rather than one AI to rule them all, um, which many, many people agree may not be likely scenario, we're thinking of something different. Right. And so we show that here, this pyramid. Uh, Alex, if you bring that up, we're envisioning uh, worker bee AIs that can perform mundane tasks more efficiently than humans. And over time, becoming increasingly adept at more advanced ta tasks. Now, uh, Jensen Wong recently said something that resonated with us. He said, quote, NVIDIA today has 32,000 employees. I'm hoping that NVIDIA someday will be a 50,000 employee company with 100 million AI assistants in every single group. We'll have a whole directory of AIs that are just generally good at doing things. And we'll also have AIs that are really specialized and super skilled. I threw in the super. We'll be, we'll be one large employee based with some will be digital and some biological. George, what's the difference between creating an all-knowing AGI that you're just referring to and swarms of worker agents. 
So, so that's the big distinction that we're trying to get at. There's um, this frontier model uh, companies that are trying to create this Messiah AGI, this godlike intelligence, and then there is a hundred thousand worker bees, each trained and specialized to do a few tasks, one or a few tasks, um, moderately well. And the point is that um, the we want to make this Messiah AGI. Um, it, the goal is is trying to make this have the intelligence to perform all the tasks that run a modern enterprise. And by contrast, the more prosaic worker bee AGIs um, learn from and augment their human supervisors and just make them much more productive. All right, let's take a look at the current ETR data with respect to LLMs and Gen AI players. This XY graph is common that we show this uh, frequently. Uh, the, the, the spending momentum or net score is shown on the vertical axis and overlap or penetration in the data set is on the horizontal plane. OpenAI and Microsoft up in, up in the right lead in mo both momentum and penetration, while the gap in AI between Google and AWS continues to close. We've commented on this and reported on it for quite some time now, several quarters. Databricks and Snowflake are coming at this from a foundation of enterprise AI, while Meta and Anthropic, you know, they're right on top of each other in this chart, but they've got highly different strategies. Uh, I, IBM One is sort of a you know, private company, for both for-profit companies, uh, Meta obviously open sourcing its LLM. Then you got IBM and Oracle very clearly focused on the enterprise. Of course, they're not, we're not talking about foundation model players here, but they're focused on applying AI to the enterprise. And then you got a mix of legacy AI companies that are shown in the pack. And in this picture, Microsoft, AWS, Databricks, Snowflake, IBM, and Oracle are firmly entrenched in the enterprise AI camp, or potentially the enterprise AGI camp, while Google, Meta, Anthropic, and OpenAI are battling it out in the foundation model race, and the pack is mostly focused on enterprise AI. So George, anything you want to add to this picture? Um, just that the, the building these building standalone agents, perhaps on these uh, what we're calling Messiah AGI um, foundation models, that's okay for simple proofs of concepts and si simple applications. But to really make agents in the enterprise work, we're going to need a foundation and tooling for building armies of agents. And that's vastly more uh, sophisticated and very different from the tools to build single agents. And we're going to get to that at the end. Okay, let's get right to the heart of the matter here. We're talking Jamie Dimon versus Sam Altman. The major battle. What do we mean here? Here's a graphic from Alex Wong of Scale AI, which shows that GPT-4 was trained on half a petabyte of data. Meanwhile, JPMC is sitting on a mountain of data that roughly equates to 150 petabytes in size. Now, George, more is not necessarily better. So take us through this. Is this, is this misleading? Um, you know, J.P. Morgan's got this huge data estate, but inherently contains know-how that's not in the public domain, that's not being scraped by LLMs across the internet. So they've got this proprietary knowledge specific to a business, and this is the key ingredient of the premise that you have been sharing with me and that we're putting forth today, and it's the source of competitive advantage. Can you explain your point of view on this? Yeah, that... Basically, the, the foundation models that we've been talking about are not hugely differentiated. They are all built on the same algorithmic architecture deriving from the transformer. They all progress in size, which we'll explain, and they all um, use the same uh, compute infrastructure for, for training. What differentiates them is the data. And um, now, it's not as you've been as you said it's not a perfect comparison to say that because jp morgan has 150 petabytes and gpt4 was trained on less than 1 petabyte that um all that data that jp morgan has can go that they have in their data estate can go into to training agents but it's it's a proxy for the fact that there is so much proprietary data locked away inside 
JP Morgan and in every enterprise that the foundation model companies will never get their hands on. And this data is really important because this is what you use to train the AI agents. Um, it's data that uh, agents will learn from, including by observing uh, human em uh, employees and capturing their thought processes. And much of that data is not even in that training data set. That's tacit knowledge currently. Um, the AI companies call this reasoning traces because um, it captures a thought process. It helps you train a model more effectively than input-output matchings. And the foundation model companies will never be able to train the public foundation models on these reasoning traces that are core to the um, know-how and operation of these firms. And so that's why the swarm of workflow agents, which are really specialized action models, collectively have the um, ability to learn and embody all that management know-how and outperform Sam's foundation model. Again, I say collectively. So the 100,000 agents as a swarm or the million agents as uh, Jensen referred to them, it's the collective intelligence of those that outperforms the singular intelligence in a frontier foundation model. Right. Okay. So you got these foundation model vendors that are battling it out, uh, chasing what we call a false grail. And as you said in our open, the stakes are insanely high. This graphic describes the scaling laws and what it takes to compete. The graph illustrates the relationship between test loss and three factors, compute, data set size and parameters, fundamental. These things are fundamental to scaling language models effectively. Each of these panels represents how test loss changes with an increase in one of these factors while the other factors are held constant, i.e. these models keep getting better and better, but staying on the frontier is brutally competitive and ex really, really expensive. And Jamie Dimon, he doesn't have to participate in the competitive race. race. Rather, he can sit back and benefit from it all and apply these innovations from the foundation model companies that are they're driving in AI to his proprietary data. So George, it's likely that this is going to continue to get worse and escalate further, isn't it? So maybe you could explain your thinking as to why, and we'll use this graphic here, um, what are you showing here and, and why does that continue? It's just another graphic showing the brutal economics of the cost of scale. As you pointed out, and, and the scaling laws that we've known about now for several years, um, each generation of model has to increase in size and compute data set size and, and parameter count, the, the, the model size itself. And, and these go up together. But when you um, increase them all together, if you look in the right-hand table, like Gemini Ultra already was cost uh, costing close to $200 million for its uh, training. And the chart that a company called Epic AI put together shows that the cost of training is going up by 2.4x, or has been going up by 2.4x per year. And there are factors that may actually accelerate that. For instance, long context windows. We believe um, that's the feature of Gemini Ultra that made it perhaps so much more expensive multiple times more expensive than GPT-4. And then there's another factor like you overtrain the model so that it is more efficient at, at uh, inference time or runtime. The point is um, there there is this enormous amount of capital going into improving the base capability, but it's not clear how differentiated the base capability of one frontier model is from the next, which is the next slide. Yeah, and so the other factor here is that not only are those models getting increasingly expensive to develop and improve, but pricing is dropping like a rock. This chart shows how the pricing is dropping by four orders of magnitude in the span of three years for GPT-3 class models. And for GPT-4 class models, they're on a trend line to drop two orders of magnitude within 24 months of introduction. So George, the point is that the price of high performing foundation models is rapidly decreasing, competition is driving down prices, and organizations can leverage those advanced language models 
much more cost effectively. That's going to facilitate wider AI integration across many, many more sectors. But doesn't this also suggest the potential commoditization of found foundation models? And, and so we enter Zuck and Elon. Can you comment on th the impact of these declining prices and the open source players, which we're showing? Yeah. Here? You know, we, we were just showing before, uh, on the last slide, we were showing uh, uh, OpenAI and Anthropic, and we didn't even include Gemini. And now we have um, Zuckerberg, which is um, Llama 3.1 is, is just really um, becoming adopted for, um, by, by, by companies, not enterprises perhaps so much as ISVs in their products. Um, and Musk has stood up uh, an H100 training cluster faster, apparently, than than anyone else, a larger one faster than anyone else. It's not completely done. But the point is, there are more frontier class competitors pouring into the market, and we already see prices, you know, dropping precipitously. So the economics of that business are not that attractive. Right. So, so continuing on this, this challenge, the conclusions, as we show here on this chart, that without new approaches to data generation or efficiency, scaling LLMs may soon face diminishing returns. They're constrained not only uh, by compute or number of parameters, but the availability of high quality data because of the scaling laws. We we need to keep scaling the training data sets, but we're running out of high quality tokens on the public internet. And George, isn't this an uh-oh moment for these foundation models? So a key, a key solution to the problem is to synthetically uh, generate data, but it can't be just any data that models generate. The data actually has to represent new knowledge, not a regurgitation of what's already in the models. and one way it can do that is with data that can be verified in the w real world, like computer code or math, because it's the verification process, like running the code, that makes it high quality data. Because you can say this is new, generating it with, was a hypothesis, testing it and validating it makes it new knowledge that's high quality. The issue is even though you can do this with code and with math, it, it doesn't actually make the models knowledgeable in, in all other domains. And that's why the models need to lead to learn from human expertise. Ah, and this, of course, was underscored by comments made recently from Alex Wang. Um, on, uh, he was doing a no priors uh, interview and conversation. Let's take a listen, and then we're going to come back and comment. Uh, please, Alex, play the clip. To make a Doom 2 analogy, I mean, I think it really is Spy, you know, data production is very similar to spice production. It is the, it will be the, the lifeblood of all the future of these AI systems. Crazy stat, but JP Morgan's proprietary data set is 150 petabytes of data. Um, GPT-4 is trained on less than one petabyte of, of data. So there's clearly so much data that exists within enterprises and, and, uh, governments that is proprietary data that can be used for training, um, incredibly powerful AI systems. I think there's this key, question of what's the what's the future of synthetic data and how synthetic data needs to emerge. And and our perspective is that the critical thing is is what we call hybrid human AI synthetic data. So how can you build hybrid human AI systems such that uh, AI are doing a lot of the heavy lifting, but human experts and people, you know, the basically best and brightest, the the smartest people, the sort of best at reasoning can contribute all of their insight and capability to ensure that you produce data that's of extremely high quality, of high fidelity, to ultimately fuel the, the future of these models. Yeah, so what, what about that, George? Will synthetic allow foundation model vendors to, to break through the data wall? And, and why here are we showing a picture of Alex next to Karl Marx? What was your thinking here? Well, you know, when Alex was saying the best and the brightest need need to contribute their reasoning and their insight. And he has apparently a peerless platform for collecting this for apparently as many as a couple hundred thousand people um, right now. 
But when I heard him say this, it sounded uh, more than a bit like Karl Marx when he said, from each according to his ability to each according to his needs. It sounds a bit like a utopian vision, almost as utopian, I'm exaggerating here, but almost as utopian as communism. It's like all that reasoning and insight is trapped inside the know-how of for-profit enterprises. And we're probably not going to extract it by paying these people, you know, 30 bucks an hour or whatever it is to generate their, to, to donate their reasoning and expertise. Right. And your point really is that Alex and his foundation model of customers, which he serves, are not going to be able to tap the collective intelligence that's trapped inside tens of thousands of companies like Jamie Dimon's firm, JPMC. And this is the real, this is the real data wall that nobody seems to be talking about. The point is enterprise AGI, as we're looking at it, is an opportunity for enterprises in the most, that we think the most value is going to accrue to those firms that can apply AI to their proprietary data, not so much to the foundation model players. And that's the premise that we're putting forth today. So what we want to do now is take another spin and look at the power law. We love to talk about power laws. We put forth the Cube AI is, or the Cube research has put out the, the Gen AI power law. Here's another take on that. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a graphic from Eric Brynjolfsson, uh, who's now with Stanford. Um, and it speaks to the automation of, of business processes that has been historically very difficult because each process is unique. It's like a snowflake and contains specific tribal knowledge uh, within that company. So enterprise apps, you know, they've been limited in terms of what they can attack. Uh, custom apps, I mean, they can attack you know, problems like HR, which are standard across any organization or largely standard, and then you, you, Firms have built custom apps to really move down this power law curve slightly, but most of the long tail remains un un unautomated. And so, George, you've taken this Brynjolfsson chart and you've superimposed agentic onto it. It's it's the hot new buzzword. Explain what you've done here and, and how it applies. Okay, so as you said, for decades we've solved um, high volume processes with packaged apps like finance, everyone does finance the same way, HR, mid-volume um, processes we tackled with custom applications, but the economics of building custom applications was difficult because you had to hand code the business rules associated with each business process. And as you said, each business process itself contained essentially a snowflake of variants that were very difficult to capture. And so the reason we couldn't get to the long tail of processes and then snowflakes within each processes is that it wasn't feasible to program the complex workflow rules. So we see a future where agents can change the economics of that. And they do that by learning from human um, actions, observing them. First, citizen developers give agents goals and guardrails but just as important, agents can generate plans with step-by-step -step reasoning that the humans can then edit. Um, and then the exception conditions become the learnable moments to help get the agent further down the long tail the next time. Okay, we're going to illustrate this now and walk you through a demo that really underscores this and explains, first of all, one, the technology to learn from human actions. It's actually being worked on today, and we're going to show you you know, an early example, too, that agents can learn from human reasoning traces, that George, those traces that George referred to before, and, and exception handling. And then three, there's still gaps to be filled and that are fundamental to enterprise AGI becoming a reality. So the first slide of the demo shows a screenshot from Microsoft's Copilot Studio. So George, walk us through this. Just, we want to show that this is concrete. It's shipping today from companies like Microsoft, Salesforce, others. The key point is that agents can learn from their human, human supervisors. We're looking at a screen here. This is defining an agent that onboards an employee. It doesn't take AGI. It doesn't even have to be fully 
Gen AI business logic. It starts by leveraging existing workflows and figuring out how to orchestrate the long tail of activities by combining and recombining those existing building blocks. So, okay, thank you. And Alex, bring up the next slide in the, in the sequence. And then George, take us through the next step. Okay, so the agent's real power is that they learn from exceptions while in production. This is the opposite of traditional software where you want to catch and suppress and uh, bugs you know, before you go into production. Here, essentially, you could think about a bug as a learnable moment. So um, this particular agent is onboarding a new employee and providing laptop options. The agent is showing you its thought process in the center pane. This is actually not what um, what you would see at runtime, but this is a, like for debugging. And it's offering the laptop. The employee works in events, and, and this particular employee needs a, a, la a tablet, not a laptop. So the agent logs or captures a teachable moment that extends what the agent can do without going back to a human supervisor um, once it learns. And that each teachable moment then extends the agent's ability to move down that power curve and handle more edge cases. Okay, so in, this, in that example, there's an exception, the, the machine can't figure it out, the human has to be brought into the loop, but the agent then learns from the, the reasoning that the human and the actions that the human took to make that next step in the process. And then that becomes codified or embedded into what is now this organic or our vision here of an organic system. Uh, remember, we're, we're getting ahead of ourselves a little bit when I talk about the digital representation of the enterprise, but, but that's where ultimately we see uh, as the North Star of this AI era. So, okay, let's show this um, in action where we look at the next slide. It's an exception where the user wants something different than what's offered on the standard menu. Go ahead, George. Well, we have to, all that's worth pointing out here is that every row you see here is an instance of the agent having run this onboarding process and the um, little red mark um, on the row where the cursor, the hand uh, cursor is indicating it shows an exception condition. And that was uh, where the, um, the human who was being onboarded, the new employee said, you know, the choices you're giving me aren't good enough. And so that then brings up the next slide, which is where um, the, yeah, the, so, so the agent is learning in this slide. Go ahead, yeah. sorry. So the so let me set it up. So so this shows the feedback loop and how the agent learns and then the system evolves. So walk us through this. It's just it's just that simple. On the right side is is the thought process. There's a, a little um uh comment that's uh that says negative feedback, the system responds accordingly. Then the agent knows that the user had that negative feedback, so it creates a potentially learnable step, um, and it expands the range of tablet options without going through, you know, all the screens. Um, and it says now when an event planner is going to be onboarded, show them tablets. Got it. Okay, thanks for that, taking us through that demo. Let's take a step back and put this into the context of seven decades of information technology progress. Your computing initially automated back office functions, and then it's evolved in, into personal computer productivity, you know, wave was a huge driver. And then when technology moves into the mainstream, the consumers of tech and those that apply it, we think are going to most effectively reap the benefits. And the tech industry we'd like to talk about is a series of waves where each subsequent wave abstracts the previous generation's complexity away. And George, where are we today and where are we headed? So just, it's worth pointing out that 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 last slide was from, you know, Carlotta Perez's very famous um, book, uh, Technological Revolutions and Financial Capital. And when, when you go through a, a wave towards the mature end of the wave, it is the people building on the technology who reap the benefits. And that's, a, that's the ultimate message we're really 
saying here that um, the foundation models are enormously capital intensive and talent intensive, but all the data that turns them into business value lies locked up inside the um, enterprises that are not going to be feeding the frontier model companies. In other words, it's the enterprises who are going to get the, the big benefits. But let's go to the next slide because that, that really sort of explains um, the stack that, yeah, so that's emerging. Th this brings us back to the you know ever-evolving technology stack, as you mentioned, and the impact that AI is going to have on this framework. What we're, so what we're showing here is the culmination of many decades of IT, where data lives everywhere. You've got IaaS, you've got PaaS, you've got SaaS. That's the underpinning of virtually every organization's business model today. It's supported by technology. It, technology touches everything. And the green blocks up top represent new stuff, emerging capabilities where we envision that real-time digital representation of an enterprise, sometimes call it a digital twin, if you will, where the people, places, things, and processes of an organization and its ecosystem are encapsulated and represented in an organic system. And so for the collective intelligence of 100,000 agents or more to work together and be successful, they need a shared source of truth. George, pick up on this and explain how we envision it playing out. So by, by analogy, everyone was talking about the agility of microservices 15 years ago, but that actually kicked the can down the road on, on a shared source of truth. Each microservice um, was able to evolve um, independently and, and very quickly, but it was responsible for its own source of truth in the form of its own uh, database. And that created actually a mess that the analytic data estate has been struggling to clean up for the last decade with first data lakes, then data lake houses, and, and the modern data stack. And the source of truth for agents is likely to be something very different from the databases we've been accustomed to for 50 years. It's not enough to up-level strings to things in the form of real-world data objects. Agents participate in business processes and the ultimate objective of the next generation of enterprise software with these armies of agents is to align all the processes of the firm, to align the activities of the human agents and the AI agents. And so we need a source of truth that abstracts the 50 years of islands of process automation and analytics. But this new source of truth has to orchestrate and analyze the state of all the business processes in the enterprise. And these processes need to share the same North Star objectives, whether it's profitability, growth, sustainability, or some combination. And, and this source of truth is unlikely to look like anything we've deployed in the last 50 years, but that's a topic for another show. Well, actually, Alex, if you would mind bringing that slide back up, uh, uh, we don't want to go too far on this, but we've, George, we've talked about this top layer before, uh, this, this digital business model, the, the, the necessary condition of harmonizing all that disparate data that's coming from, whether it's back-end operational systems, analytic systems, uh, you know, historical systems of truth, and then this a, a, a agentic or agent control framework you know, to, to manage and govern and, and control uh, those agents and them able to interpret those top-down goals. I want to ask you, though, this analytics layer at the top, that's different than the traditional analytics uh, that we've known and, and loved and industries have built up around. Please explain. That, that um, it's the analytics and the digital business model are very different. The, they're process-centric. We've We've, for, for 50 years, been really managing things at, at best, usually strings, but they're, but they're entities. They're, they're people, places, and things. Um, we, we manage, you know, invoices. We manage orders. We manage um, customers. But we've not done a good, a, a good job of managing the processes that link all those and that we've done an even poorer job of analyzing how all those processes 
fit together and how to align and optimize them. That's what's going to change. That's a completely different type of source of truth from, from the SQL databases and even the NoSQL databases that we've been building on. And, and once you have that source of truth, then the analytics, the analytics look completely different as well. And, and in part, the blocker there, the challenge has been those processes are just so unique to organizations and extremely hard to understand and, and, and replicate at scale. Yeah, the, the, there are multiple ways um, that different uh, emerging vendors are going about trying to learn what's in there and reverse engineer and build this new abstraction layer. But um, um, we've touched on that, you know, there's, uh, we've, we've talked about relational AI, we've talked about Salonis, we've talked about Palantir, and we've talked about the friend of the cube, Enterprise Web. But um, they're all coming at this from different angles. And um, I think exploring the trade-offs and the approaches of each and then the types of applications you can build on top of them is something we'll have to develop over time. Yep. The topic for another day, George. Thanks so much. I appreciate your insights and, and time. Okay, that's it for now. What do you think? Do you believe that the massive investments going to foundation models are misguided um, in a quest for fool's gold? Or do you believe that one model will rule them all, including enterprise AGI? What do you think about this concept about enterprise AGI? And will foundation model vendors like OpenAI ultimately develop a business model that can dominate and capture much of that value? Or do you believe that enterprises are going to leverage the hundreds of billions of dollars pouring into AI and Gen AI for their own proprietary benefit, keep it for themselves. Let us know what you think. All right, thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Shipman on production and in our podcast, Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and in our newsletters, and Rob Hof is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. Thank you all. Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com. You can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante. Comment on our LinkedIn post, and please check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETR. Thanks for watching, everybody. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.